When I was a kid, I listened to a soap opera because uh, I was ill for a period of time. And the name of it was Our Gal Sal. And the tagline was, how did a little girl from a mining town in the West <laughs> grow, up to, to grow up to marry a rich and famous lord? So, Anne, how did a school... <laughs> How did a school librarian from Alaska get to be a president of ALN? I didn't marry a rich and famous lord. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that. Well, it's, you know, it's really interesting. I grew up not far from here. I grew up in San Bruno. How many of you here um, were in the Bay Area in 1978? Ooh, lots. You guys haven't moved far from home. In fact, when I look at my high school graduating class, they haven't moved far from home either. But when I was in high school, and I went to Cappuccino High School in San Bruno, um, my, his, my government teacher was Leo J. Ryan, who was killed in the Jonestown Massacre in 1978 in Guyana. And we had Student Government Day. I wanted to be the mayor, and he made me the librarian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the time, I, I should have taken a word of wisdom from Leo J. Ryan, because if I had, I wouldn't have waited till I was 30 to go to library school. I would have gone when I was 22, but you know, now when I think back on it, you know, Mr. Ryan was right. I got to be the librarian, and I got to be the mayor. Um, and that's my job this year, to be the president of the American Library Association. But um, we moved from the Bay Area and eventually ended up in 1972 in Alaska. And the only job that was there available was in a school library. And I thought, well, okay, I can do this. I've now been with the Juneau School District for 27 years. And I'm, I'm really amazed that I'm still a school librarian when I started out as a serials cataloger. But when you work in a one-person library, there isn't anybody else to talk to. Uh, at least in terms of your professional colleagues. And so one of the things that I did was I got interested in association activities, and that was the Alaska Library Association. And for many years, I did just about every job that one could do in the Alaska Library Association. But walking down the street in San Francisco, 1983, when, when ALA conference was here, 81, sometime in the early 80s, you know, I thought, I kind of like ALA. This is kind of fun. You know, maybe I'll run for ALA chapter counselor. And for those of you who don't know, ALA is governed by a council of 170 people, all of whom have different ideas about how ALA should run. Um, but each state gets one, so I decided to run for Alaska chapter counselor, which I did, and I spent four years. I mean, you come in and you know absolutely nothing about ALA. You're so green, you don't know how it works, you don't know what the issues are, and you know, you kind of sit there. And so for four years, I didn't say a word, except for the state of Alaska brings a check for $50. Right. <laughs> right. You know, but I work behind the scenes, because I've always been a hard worker. And somewhere along the way, I looked at the ALA executive board and I thought, you know, this executive board, those people who are elected to govern us or to be our leaders, they don't represent me. I feel like I'm an average member of ALA. I work in a one-person library. I live in a small town. I live in a state that's quite isolated. We didn't have the internet back then. Um, and I thought, this board is only, excuse me, big public library directors. <laughs> deans of library schools, yeah. uh, directors of academic libraries, and I thought, where are, where are just the regular people? You know, those of us who've been in ALA for 100 years, so I thought, I could run for the ALA executive board. But before I did that, I thought, well, I'll call one of the, the ALA past presidents to be nameless, not you. Okay. And she said to me, oh dear, you're certainly not qualified to do this job. <laughs> you couldn't possibly do this job. You don't understand the issues. They're very complex. So I thought, OK, scratch that one. I'll go on to the next person I know. And, and this, I, I really want to spend a moment here. Regina has been, I think, a mentor to so many people throughout the American Library Association because she has that kind of personality. I didn't know Gina. She was president when I was on council and then she was past president. And one of the things I found is that, you know, you don't have time at conference to talk to people. But I always felt like she was a person that I could kind of just call up and say, you know, can I talk to you? So I did. And I think I even called you at home. Horror, I think so. horror of horrors, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, as a librarian, I'm very, um, um, what's the word, 
Resourceful. Yes. Resourceful. That's a good word. I'm very resourceful as a librarian. So I found her home phone number and I called her up and I said, Gina, do you think I could run for the ALA executive board? Now, whether she was just being presidential and lying to me <laughs> or not, you know, <laughs> she was very, very gracious. And I think that to me that was, you know, as just one of these regular members, she gave me the assurance that I had a place there at the table, um, that I could indeed learn what the issues were, that this wasn't a job that was out of the realm of possibility for anybody. That's uh -huh. right. And and um, is not painting herself as brightly as you might think. I mean, she knows how to organize. She, when you ran for ALA executive board, people knew Anne because she had talked to people. People knew Anne because she made good statements. And didn't you win again by, yes, by the, the largest I mean, number of it, votes? It, you know, it isn't luck. <laughs> You, 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 you plan where you're going to do, you plan what you're going to say. She's one of these people that say, she says, now how do I do this? And said, so, well, Anne, first you do this, and then you do that, and then you do this, and then you do the other thing. And then she turns around and does it, and it works. Always amazes me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it was very interesting, because I was really actually petrified when I ran for the ALA executive board. I was afraid somebody would ask me a hard question. Um, and so... But one of the other people who'd been on the executive board, a colleague of Gina's, said, all you have to do is walk up to people and put out your hand and say, hi, I'm Ann Simons. I'm running for the LA executive board. That's right. And that's what I did. I met every single person on council. Nobody ever asked me a hard question. No, because they don't have any. So, so I, you know, I got on the ALA executive board, and I almost missed the first meeting because they didn't tell me where it was. <laughs> But I do remember sitting with Gina because she was just going off the board and she told me everything I needed to know except when the meeting was and where it started. <laughs> and we met in executive session, our very first meeting, and the person we were doing some IFLA nominations or something really, but we had all these resumes, people's resumes. And um, one of the people sitting across the table from me, Dr. Bob Stewart, who was wanting an IFLA position, had a resume. It was 34 pages long. And I'm going, well, what am I doing here? You know, my resume, I could barely get it on one page at that time because, of course, I'd only ever had one job or two jobs. Um, but when you get on the ALA executive board, again, I met another person like Regina who decided I could be the treasurer of ALA. I didn't decide I was going to be the treasurer. You know, it was our current then treasurer, Carla Stoffel, who thought, you know, I'll train this woman. She can be our treasurer. But when you get on the ALA executive board, what you find out is that any given minute, everybody on the board is running for president of ALA. <laughs> All 12 people are running, except for the president and the past president and the president-elect. Everybody's running for president. And, you know, somewhere along the way, I decided, oh, I could do that, too. And I think one of the things Gina will tell you that the odds of being president of ALA, um, coming from a state with 208 yeah. ALA members. Um, kind of zip. <laughs> <laughs> but from a one-person library. Right, but you're a politician. Oh, thank you. She knows how to work the crowd. I learned it from you. She knows. <laughs> Well, I always have three things to say to people, you know, when I go to a I hate key messages. Parties. I always have three things that I can say, and I say them over and over and over again, so that it seems like new stuff. But you ran a campaign, and you ran a sensible campaign, based on some issues and based on what, what I mean, Anne thought, she thinks, which is a really nice thing. <laughs> uh, and you ran on issues, and you ran on a program. And, and at least for me, one of the things that pleased me a lot is I had, a, I had a good opponent, somebody who wasn't a close personal friend. And the thing that you find when you work in ALA is that you make a lot of friends. And you make a lot of friends that you keep for life. And I never wanted to run against somebody who was a really close personal friend. Staff may remember who that other <laughs> candidate was. Uh, so we'll go on. We'll go on. But it was, <laughs> yeah. I, had a great, I had a great opponent. That's right. Um, one of the issues that we all face uh, right now, all of us, no matter where we work or in what library, is the internet. And all over the country, librarians and others are defending the fact that we don't want to filter. And we all need help and support in this issue. And often the intellectual freedom stance is hard to defend because I recall talking to my sister who's a grandmother. She had seven children, now she has seven grandchildren. And one of my great nephews, every time he comes down to San Francisco, gets online in, at my sister's house and surfs. And surfs where you might expect a 15-year-old who is curious to surf. 
Now, my sister says, why should I allow him to do this? And I say, well, Vic, there are lots of other places that he can find these photographs. And so defend, and she said, well, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be, children shouldn't be allowed to do that. And she's a reasonable person. And the difficulty is that many people who want filtering are reasonable people, and they have reasonable concerns about their children and about what happens to children. So, and, and the sexually explicit sites that, that kids can access, even though we all know they're all only thumbnails, et cetera. So, Anne, what's ALA doing to help us here? Everything. <laughs> this, this has probably been one of the hardest things that ALA has had to deal with, is the issue of what it is people want children to see or not see on the internet. And you know, this is not a new issue, because this goes back when you look at the number of book challenges that we've had every year over the last uh, many years since the Office for Intellectual Freedom has been keeping statistics, several hundred people, and we know that's just a tip in the bucket, you know, challenge what kids read. And generally it is kids. But the internet has, has really added a new dimension to this. And I think one of the, one of the problems that we have is that when you split the argument in two, you know, the value of access to information over the value of protecting children, this is not an either or argument. And the way people want to set this up is that if you believe in access to information, then you don't believe in protecting children. Or if you believe in protecting children, then you've got to limit access to information. And what we know is that that's not true. I mean, I think that librarians, as much as anybody, care about children. They care about what children see, what they watch, what they do. Um, and one of the ways we do that is by educating kids and educating parents. And so I think that we've been painted into, the, into a corner often as we don't protect children. And what we have to do is recapture that language to say, yes, we do protect children, and these are the ways that we do it. Um, this is an argument that you, that's not winnable. It's it's the kind of right. when when did you stop beating your wife lately? And so we've had our three sound bites here, and we've moved on to our next three sound bites, and we're moving to our next three sound bites. Um, but I can honestly say that things are getting better because. I, I guess there's several reasons. We have a parent's corner on the ALA website. Right. It's www.ala.org. And then just right up in the right-hand corner, you can click on parents. We all want kids to have a safe, rewarding experience right. online. And we want parents to take the responsibility for that. In, you know, Gina, going back to Gina's nephew, you know, people can do whatever they want in their home. And in terms of filtering, I see nothing wrong with encouraging parents to filter in their home if that's the way they feel um, that they can protect, best protect children. Interestingly enough, this, in this week's USA Today, I think it was Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday, in the technology section, they actually rated filters for the home. Interesting. Um, and I think that those are things, I mean, I think every librarian should know about filters. They should know how they work. They should know what they do. What did I do with it? Come on. My paper is... There somewhere, in My paper is... I was interested to see what kind of star ratings they gave to the filters. Come on, paper. Um, but the most interesting thing that they said in this whole... Oh, look, look, my paper's defective. <laughs> Actually, it's not even here. I must have taken it out. <laughs> The most effect, the thing that they said in this article, even talking about filtering in the home, is that the most effective filter is still the parent. Absolutely, no question. Um, and so, when you talk about libraries, but we, when you move then to a public institution, particularly a public library, we know that the internet is protected by the First Amendment. So I think that we have to come up with other strategies, and one of them that ALA has come up with is, you know, certainly tips for keeping kids safe online, um, and the America Links Up campaign in which we encourage libraries to do classes for parents and kids. And, and I, the good news to me is that the questions are turning around. I mean, I would always hate it when a reporter called because they would say, um, so tell me, why are you giving, you know, why are you letting kids access smut on the internet in your library? 
That's usually That's the, the question. That's the question. Yeah, right. At ALA this last midwinter, the questions from the media were all exactly the same. Tell us how technology is changing the face of libraries. That's a better question. Which is a better question. Now, we're, we're trying to move away and getting, get, getting rid of the word use of the word filtering. How about web management? I think, hey, hey, not, sounds better than how filter. about some sort of management for some, that anarchy that is the internet, right? Uh, um, and it, what you know, and our three now, our three key sound bites are that people have the right to access what it is that they kids, and that includes children, um, what it is they need to live, work, learn in their communities. That these are local issues. Mm -hmm. Um, that each local community gets to make the decisions about how the internet is managed and that libraries have internet access policies. Yes. And so, uh, the LA uh, City Library, LA Public Library, has just recently, I meant to mention this last night, um, has recently determined that in their children's rooms, when they put up uh, the web browser, that it will default to a search engine called Yahooligans mm -hmm. and another one whose name I can't remember, uh, but only in the children's areas. Now, this isn't filtering. It's just that they're using a specific search engine. And if the kid is savvy enough, and believe me, they probably oh, all they are, are. Uh, they can back right out and get out to where they want. What do you think about that as an approach? I think it's fine. Um, and they, kids can also go anywhere in the library they want and use any other terminal. Right. And, uh, you know, I have no problem with any of that. I think where I have a problem is when the library or the library board decides what it is that individual people in their community should and should not see. Um, we, we, there has not been, you know, what's, what's happening is that we are winning in the court of law. We're not winning in the court of public opinion. Um, yeah, the, the decision at, uh, at Livermore, for instance, recently, uh, this is the second dismissal of that suit, which we believe is going to go now to the state appellate court and might possibly go as far as the Supreme Court. And quite frankly, because of the way the suit has drawn, it's so narrow, um, I believe the gist of it is that um, they have a right to be protected from sexually explicit information. And nobody thinks that the Constitution actually says that. And therefore, the argument that it's a constitutional issue has not been raised. So we'll have to see what happens as the Livermore case progresses. Well, and that was so different than the Loudon case. The Loudon exactly. case was you, the library was sued by citizens of their own community called Mainstream Loudon because they were filtering. Now in Livermore, they were sued because they weren't filtering. So you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. That's right. And uh, isn't that fun? That's one of the joys of working you know, I, with the I'm public. The case that I'm really looking forward to is, is you know, a case that involves children. We know that schools have more, uh, that the courts are going to allow schools more limitations yeah. than they are. Um, but I work in a school district. We have um, 40 internet access terminals in my high school library. We're not filtering any of them. Because in schools, it's never going to be appropriate, never, for a high school kid to go look at www.hornyhousewives.com during right. the school day. Right. Send them to the public library. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll have that. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's, let's go on. Um, National Library Week is... Alan, did you have a question? We have a, a mic, so because we're we're taping, so let's. I bet you're going to talk about the 700 plus great websites for kids, aren't you? Sure, I'll be glad to talk about that. Well, I think the 700 plus great websites is a great site, but actually that wasn't what I was going to talk about. But you should check it out because it's a great site for kids to use, and and it's a positive approach to the whole issue, which I think is the the best the note for the whole thing. Uh, but I was real excited to find out about the search engines that actually have filters connected to them that you can choose to use only on the basis, and I guess I'm kind of asking for a legal opinion, that maybe some, maybe some of these objections from the public would not have as firm a, a, a foot to stand on because you are in the position where you can choose a filter or, or not choose a filter right from the start and that parents then could be told that that is an appropriate thing for them to make a decision about with their kids. So I'm just kind of asking whether you think that's important or not really. I do think it's important and I think that, you know, as technology changes, I think what we're going to see are a lot of changes in technology. And as technology changes, I guess it's my hope that where we get to is a place where you can walk into your public library, you know, that the terminals are unfiltered and then you have a choice of what you want to do. If you want to hit the Christian Coalition filter, you know, 
on the touch screen or however you can hit that and your information's filtered. If you want to use a search engine that's filtered, that's fine. I mean, you know, we as the American Library Association, I mean, our, our whole, I think our whole mission is individual choice. If you want to limit those choices for yourself, that's, your that's fine. I think that the problems are going to come in is what that means when you limit that access for kids. Or for others. For others. Right. Um, you know, okay. do you need affirmative parental permission for a 17 and a half year old to use the internet? All right, let's move Go on. on. Okay, good. National Library Week is coming up April 11th to 17th. Now, I've always wondered why we have it during National Income Tax Week. Uh, <laughs> because, Before my time. Well, I tried to change it, but the date seemed immutable. Um, what are the themes and plans this year for National Library Weekend? Well, I'm really pleased to announce that one of the things that the president gets to do or doesn't get to do, depending, um, is help set the National Library Week theme. And the National Library Week theme this year is Read, Learn, Connect at the Library. Now, I'll tell you, last Saturday I was in Chicago. I packed a whole box of stuff for you, buttons, decals, all sorts of things, and they didn't show up here in the box. The brochures came. The brochures and came. And they are in the back. If any of you didn't get yeah. them, be sure but to them But I think National Library Week, it's a good time to, to focus media attention on what you're doing in your library, the services you've had in the last year, the successes you've had, the programs. Um, it's something that's celebrated all over the United States, States at a local level. It's also School Library Media Month in April, so it's a good time to, uh, to work with the schools. But Read, Learn, Connect at the library is the theme. Special plans um, you'll find in the brochures. Lots of suggestions, suggestions. lots of ideas. Um, yeah. OK, so I just, just want to make sure everybody got them if they want them. What um, are you doing to celebrate National Library? What are we doing? I haven't got a clue. Uh, at so, this moment, I'm sure Marcia can tell us <laughs> what we're doing to celebrate National Library Week. I'm sure it's extensive. I'm sure there's a lot of things, and I'm sure things are going on everywhere. But, well, and some, uh, some people say, you know, why, why have a special week? Because we celebrate libraries every, every week every of the day. year and every day. And I think that's, that's a real part of my key message this year is that I like the celebrating part. I do, too. Um, I think it's really important to celebrate what we do and to celebrate each other. Okay, tell us a bit about what it's like to be ALA president. I remember, but maybe these folks would like to know what you think was the most fun, what was the most interesting, what do you find to be most difficult, and what do you think you're going to have as a lasting accomplishment? Okay. Um, well, it's a lot of hard work, I'll tell you that. I mean, I. I you know, even being for almost 10 years on the ALA executive board and watching every president before me, I never believed them when they told me how much work it is. And I think a lot of it is, you know, the work that you do out representing the association, but there's a lot of behind the scenes work too. And that's the part that you just don't. And now with email, um, I mean, I, in fact, I don't know how we ever operated without email, because at least now the communication back is, is so easy, but it also is, you know, I, I can't let a day go by that I don't do my email oh, because there are hundreds of messages. And I get messages from all sorts of people. I got a message this week from a man in Pakistan telling me how excited he was to be coming to ALA conference, an annual conference in New Orleans. And uh, would I please make the arrangements for his airline ticket? <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing sometimes you get. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, but what were what and were you the, did it, didn't you? You arranged for his tickets in his yeah, right, hotel. Right, right, right. I asked I the so. LA staff to write him a letter <laughs> saying, you know, it's just I wrote back and said, please draft the letter that says thank you, but no thank you. Um, fun things. I mean, really, every president has highlights in their year. Um, and, you know, things you'll always remember. I think some of the things that I remember will be going to Paris, to the American Library in Paris. They had a gala fundraising dinner with Gregory Peck. Yes. You know, and I got to sit at Gregory Peck's that. table. That was, that was okay. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed that. A, lot, a couple weeks ago, I was on the Today Show. Um, and Katie Curry, it was the Newberry Caldecott Awards. It was the announcement of the Newberry Caldecott Awards. And what was so fun about that was that we were the second to the last segment just before the groundhog. Uh, 
and because we were then essentially last, it went from Katie and the Newberry Caldecott to Matt and the Groundhog, they didn't kick us out of the, uh, of the studio. We got to stand there on the edge of the set and watch them do the Groundhog and watch them finish up the program. In fact, they, you know, eventually we went from there to the Rosie O'Donnell show um, because they gave everybody in the audience a copy of the Newberry and the Caldecott winning books that day which was really exciting. Yeah, I happened not to have enough to do during ALA. That's what happens to dinosaurs. And uh, I was in the room watching Rosie when they, when they did that. I had no idea you were the yeah, audience. Yeah, it was lots but of fun. But it was fun. really neat because she gave everybody a copy of both, of both winners, which yeah. I think was great. I mean, those were certainly some of the highlights. One of the most interesting things I did um, was testify, testify before the National Commission on Libraries and Information, um, serve sciences services, and they had a hearing called the internet, kids in the internet, the promise and the peril. And it was like sitting through an old fashioned reconsideration hearing where the only thing they focused on was the peril of the internet. And practically by the end of the day, they were all taking the pledge. I believe in protecting children. You know, and I believe in protecting children too, but I think that, you know, our national commission has to take up, up the same banner of the First Amendment and protecting access to information. I guess I found that interesting. Uh, have they have they redone that? I understand they were redoing. They're working that on it. They they are working on their brochure, and it actually came out more positive. The first version of it, the first draft that we that I saw anyhow, had librarians as one of the perils. Yeah, I <laughs> I had lunch with one of the I had a pickup lunch with one of the commissioners and, who was showing me this, and I. I think what I looked at that and said, where did this come from? Librarians who don't have time to work with kids. Now, tell me, we're all busy, but when has a kid ever come to you and, and a librarian has said to them, I'm sorry, I don't have time to work with you? Not very often, Not very I often. hope. Um, I work in a school district. We have a, we have a contract that says, other duties as assigned. <laughs> That's in all your job descriptions. Um, I think that one of the, you know, probably the hardest thing about this job is the other duties as assigned. You never know what they're going to be. At midwinter, unfortunately, very early in the morning, one of our, the wives of one of our members called us and she says, you know, Ann, this is Polly Marvin died last night. You know, one of our members died at annual conference. And the person she called was the ALA president. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's what happens. And I, I think that, uh, and Marvin, this is Marvin, Marvin Skilkin, Skilkin from the Unabashed, the Unabashed li Librarian. Uh, and he's been on ALA Council for many, many 20 years. 20 years? At least. At least. I think his was the only permanent seat left. And uh, <laughs> I, I was a great guy, one of, one of the, the, the guys who could come up and ask, ask the seemingly simple question that has incredible ramifications. And, and he also uh, led the fight uh, uh, to get booksellers to give libraries better discounts. Years, Without a whole years lot ago. of support, yeah. uh, uh, many years ago. So that's the one of the things that happens is when you're ALA president is you get the highs, but you also get the lows. And, and most people don't see the lows. Right, they don't because they're all behind scenes and 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 you have to make the public presentation. Now, what I've I've warned Anne is that that during annuals she has to really be careful because you smile so much your face hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, you wake up in the morning with the smile, and, and you end the day with the same smile on your face. And but, the day is from 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. Yeah, usually. And people think, Anne, that when you're ALA president, all you do is go to these wonderful dinners and meetings, and chauffeurs drive you around. Not. 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 <laughs> you work your whatever. But give us your best pitch, Anne, for coming to New Orleans this summer. Well, I haven't told you what my greatest accomplishment oh, well, is yet. Well, that? excuse me. Okay. Um, ALA Council passed the first new intellectual freedom policy since, I guess, we revised the Library Bill of Rights in 1980. It's called Libraries and American Value. Uh, everybody will get a copy in the June-July issue of American Libraries, along with tip sheets on how to use this. And it's a 21st century intellectual freedom statement that's uh, designed for the public, not for librarians. That's great. I've and seen so it And so I draft. think we've it's just, you know, it's just been in draft form to now. But I hope that that's one of my accomplishments. And the other, I think, is the fact that we spend a year really celebrating um, the freedom to read. Good. You know, in the 30th anniversary of the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Annual conference, my best pitch, huh? Yeah, give us a pitch. Why should we go? Well, first off, it's in New Orleans. 
and everybody aside left. from the good food. Yeah, why we, should we go? <laughs> Gina remembers the time when the mayor of New Orleans had to come and convince ALA Council that New Orleans right. was a good place for us, right. that we were a good fit because our members did not seem to want to go to New Orleans. Now they can't seem to want to stay away. New Orleans is a great convention center, convention city, and I think. Like San Francisco, it's one of the few cities in the country that has some character. Yeah. And I think that's why our members like to come to San Francisco, too. Any special programs you got Yeah, um, Colin Powell will be the opening general session speaker. We're having, instead of the all-conference reception, we're going to have an end-of-the-century scholarship bash in which we raise money for... Um, to ensure that there's a generation of librarians who follow follow those of us who have gray hair. And mm -hmm. um, we're hoping to raise a lot of money. We're gonna have world-class entertainment. We're hoping to have the Neville brothers that night. Great. Oh yeah, we're, we're, we're this far from signing the contract. Um, right. We actually sold tickets at midwinter and not having the contract signed yet. <laughs> It's like being a little bit pregnant. By the end of conference, we were very <laughs> pregnant. We right. still don't have the contract signed. But um, my president's program is going to be called the First Amendment Conversation. It's going to be similar to this. It's going to be with Christy Hefner from Playboy Enterprises, the, the CEO of Playboy Enterprises, Nadine Strassen, uh, president of the ACLU, and Bruce Ennis, who's argued more cases before the Supreme, more First Amendment cases before the Supreme right. Court than anybody else today living. Yeah, Bruce has been the he was counsel. For, he is counsel for the Freedom Tree. For the yeah, he's been counsel for quite yeah, a while. Yeah, and he also argued yeah. the CDA case before right. the Supreme Court. Right. So good food, good networking, lots of people to see. Lots of good programs. Lots of good programs. Sign up early. Don't miss. Yeah. Okay. I hear you're doing a book. I am doing a book. Well, tell me about it. This is the plug. Uh, this is the <laughs> plug for the book. Coming out before annual conference. Tell us about it. It's called um, Speaking Out, Voices in Celebration of Intellectual Freedom. We kind of took a uh, cut through the intellectual freedom community, asked people to pick a quote, and then tell us why it was important to them. But we also just took a very, very long list of celebrities, wrote to them just cold, and then said, you know, would you do something for our book? And we got back some very interesting contributions from Ed Asner, from Barney Frank, U.S. Representative Barney Frank, Pat Schroeder. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, but it's a nice mix of librarians and non-librarians. Great. Short essays, things that you can figure out how to use in your library. We'll be autographing at the ALA store. Great. Sally Reed and I, who, who edited the book. Okay, well, we're doing right, really we're well. Good. You have a clock up there? Oh. Yeah, we got a clock so we can, we can check here. Good, let's hear from these people. Well, yeah, a frequent question that I get from the media, and I'm sure Ann does too, is what will happen to libraries in the 21st century? Do you still need books? Do you mm. still need all that space? Mm. Um, what will be the most important issues libraries will face? So Anne and I have decided that instead of telling you what we think, we'd like to hear what you think. So what do you guys think is going to be some of the most important issues of the 21st century? Uh, what's going to be hot as we move into the 21st century? This may not be a very exciting issue, but I think it's crucial for library services, and that's the whole question of changes in intellectual property and copyright. Mm -hmm. there may, you may not know it or not, but there's a move afoot to revise the Uniform Commercial Code to apply contract law instead of copyright law to electronic publications. Would you talk about this whole area? Because I'm not sure it's really realized the impact that it could have on library operations for all types of libraries. I think it's an incredibly common complex issue and absolutely right it's one that comes to the top of everybody's list right now is copyright um, especially digit copyright in the digital age you know do are we going to have to pay per use per packet how is information you know what what does fair use mean in the digital environment it's an incredibly complex subject it's really not one I can talk about knowledgeably and that's one thing I have learned is that a as ALA president you cannot talk about every single subject knowledgeably we, ALA is involved although I oh, believe absolutely. In, the, in the discussion absolutely and, uh, is and along with the uh, seven other US library associations ARL the Association of Research Libraries the Special Libraries Association we have a Digital Futures Coalition um, we're certainly trying to impact legislation in this area. 
Um, the publishers are trying to, and they have lots more money than we do. But I think the one thing that pleases me is that a the ALA Washington office is at the table. That's We're very definitely at the table. Um, we have our own lawyers, our intellectual property lawyers, who are who are there, you know, making trying to make sure um, that that we're there and that the issues, that the rights and the needs of of people who use libraries are represented. Yes, because it could be incredibly, I mean, it could really make an enormous change in the way people can access information and in the way libraries are able to provide it. So it's this is where having a uh, a proactive national organization with some clout is really important to libraries throughout that's, the country. You know, that's what ALA does. That's right, and what ALA does, does best, yes. actually. Any other hot topics people want to talk about? Yeah. I just want to bring it up. Literacy, helping the have-nots get access. Literacy, absolutely. In fact, ALA has identified its five key action areas um, for the beginning of the next century. Literacy is there. Uh, diversity is there, intellectual freedom, um, continuous learning, continuous and lifelong learning, access to information, equality okay. and access to information. Uh, we just hired a new literacy officer at ALA, oh, our good. first ever literacy officer. Um, so clearly, and we're seeing that we're able to partner um, with big national corporations in the literacy effort, and that's, um, in fact, in terms of priorities for the Fund for America's Libraries and going out and raising money for programmatic um, issues, the Spectrum Minority Scholarship was one of our areas, and literacy was another one. And I think literacy needs to encompass as well computer literacy. Absolutely, all types of literacy. It has to be all types of literacy for all kinds of Adult people. literacy, children. Yes. Um, this is probably a good way to seg in, segue into the uh, demographic shifts, not only in the Bay Area, but throughout our country. How will we take a more proactive, rather than a reactive, uh, approach to the language needs? Because not everything is uh, uh, universally accepted in terms of English. And because of the shifts from the Asian Pacific Rim as well as the European needs and all throughout the world, how will we take a more proactive Well, I think position? ALA has already started doing that in that um, this last year we entered into a partnership, a three-year partnership with um, FEEL, which is the, for, uh, I'm, let me just, my Spanish isn't that good. The, the Guadalajara Book Fair people. And we sponsored, between the two of us, we sponsored 200 people, to librarians to go to the Guadalajara Book Fair. Um, and I think this is one of the ways to, to see the materials, to be able to buy the materials on the spot, to um, have programs for librarians who went to, for them to be able to get the best out of the fair for their patrons. And it was very interesting because there were many librarians from the Bay Area who were there who've been going for many years who told the rest of us, you know, bring lots of suitcases, bring lots of cash, get your, get your director to give you cash so you can buy on the spot. But I think that, that Hispanic materials are just one of the languages. And I think that one of the ways that ALA, we have an ethnic materials round table, but I think one of the ways is that we are looking at these book fair programs getting librarians to the source of the materials um, so that they can buy, so that collection development people can buy on the spot and talk to publishers who are uh, publishing materials that people back here need. It's a continuing issue in cities like San Francisco right. and in California and other Pacific Rim states. Uh, the, the school district in San Francisco, I believe, uh, teaches in 140 or 150 different languages. And we buy in about, and how many languages we buy? 45, 55 different languages? 35, 35 and then maybe, I think Tony told me it was. Thank you, thank languages. you. I know that children was doing more. It's a lot of book fairs, but it's also what happens here, and I think this is part of what Virginia was leading up to, is what happens to the rest of the collection also, I mean, you, you, it, your emphasis has to be, you need to provide the materials and the languages that people want to read, and that's in addition to, to in addition all to the, of the internet, things we have always been doing. And that's one of the things I think, uh, it's like everything is a value added 
You know, don't stop anything you were doing, but start doing all these other things and do it with the same amount of money. Now, a lot of libraries are lucky and they have relatively good budgets, but those libraries who don't have good budgets are in a real bind. And I think it's a political issue as well as a social issue. And it's a thing that has to be addressed at the local level just as much as it does at the national level. Now, I saw Laura over here. Yeah. I want, wait, I want to ask you a question first. Oh, sure. Do you remember what the uh, theme of your presidency was? Yes, diversity. It was the challenge of diversity. That's right. And, you know, I think that one of the marks of a good ALA president is that that theme is just as um, hot, just as valid today as it was 12 years ago, 13 years ago when Gina was president. And I think that those are issues that we're definitely um, working we on. We must address. Yeah. Jackie. Yeah, so I'd like to bring up the issue, or go back to the issue of literacy and focus in on information literacy, especially since you are a school librarian. And that is, information literacy is one thing that really differentiates school libraries and their mission um, versus other libraries, yet the public doesn't know it. In California, I know that there's legislation once again, encouraging partnerships or joint use facilities between public and school libraries. But a lot of that is because they don't understand the difference of the missions. And although there's a lot of you know, good reasons to combine, um, I think the, um, the whole issue of information literacy could be, um, could be brought further into the public's mind by the ALA. And I wanted to hear a few words about that. Our, I'm, and I think as a school librarian, our job is to graduate kids who know how to be critical thinkers. And I think that's the most important thing that we can do in an information age. Um, I've worked in a community where we've had joint public school libraries. I don't think they, I mean, unless you can convince me, I, I haven't seen them work well. Um, I think a lot has to do with the planning right, and the siting and how entrances and exits are done. And frankly, it's my opinion that if a school and a public library share space, the public library should manage it. Mine too. And, that's the, and, and I have a very good reason for that. And that is because the material that we have in a public library has a greater span of interest than the material that a school library will have. And it's very important that a public library does not become restricted to the educational level in the school. And I think we have one more question in the back. Is that right, Laura? And this yes. will have to be our last one, I'm sorry. Uh, thanks to the ALS uh, uh, International Relations Roundtable uh, travel grant uh, that I got last year to go to the Zimbabwe International Book Fair, and also the support that I got from my library. Uh, I was really very delighted to be at the book fair, and uh, probably I was the only American uh, librarian uh, at the book fair. And I want to ask uh, you, uh, Ms. Simmons, what would uh, ALA do to, to encourage American librarians to go to the Zimbabwe book fair? It's really a great book fair, and there are really very good books. And uh, also to encourage American libraries to buy books published in Africa. It would support African publishers, and also we can have really very uh, good books that are not available uh, in any of uh, you know, the distribution uh, channels here in, in the States. I'm glad you asked that question because ALA has entered into the same kind of partnership with the Zimbabwe Book Fair that we have with the Guadalajara Book Fair. And we're taking people back again this year. Um, if you go to ALA's website, they are now seeking applications for people to go to Zimbabwe Book Fair. They're providing free registration. They're providing money, part of the money toward airfare. And so I think that we're looking at these type of partnerships with many different uh, areas of the world where there are book fairs and, and librarians can find value in them. Okay, good. Is there anything you'd like to add in closing, Ann? Or? Yes, I hope you'll all, uh, if you're not a member of ALA, Join I it. hope you'll consider joining. ALA has a lot to offer. Um, whether you go to conferences, whether you don't, whether you use our website, and be sure to go to www.ala.org. There's always something there. There are many listservs that you can join. Um, That's right. There's a 89 active listservs, so if you don't get enough email, 
Uh, <laughs> I get enough email. <laughs> I do, too. And I want to thank well, you thank for coming. You. We really are honored to have you well, here with you. us it's today. It's a delight to be here. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. And I'll send stuff. <laughs>